Welcome everybody to today's lecture. Um, I'm glad to see some familiar faces of people that have been coming to quite a few of these lectures and also welcome to those of you that um, are coming here for the first time. Um, today we have the pleasure of welcoming Ms. Shigita Gounden from the Square Kilometre Array South Africa. Um, she has taken time out of her very busy schedule to be with us um, and will be talking to us a bit about the SKA and what they the road um, ahead. Um, Shigita is a computer engineer and is, was in 2015 selected as one of the Mail and Guardian two, top 200 young South Africans. In this lecture we will find out what we intend to discover with the SKA and how South Africa, together with a number of countries um, across Africa, plan to develop expertise and next generation technologies that, that will bring scientists to the cradle of humankind to seek its origins of the universe. Please welcome Shigita Gounden to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. There are a lot of people here. OK. <laughs> um, thank you for coming to the lecture. And it's really encouraging to see so many people interested in hearing more about the SKA and what we do. Um, the talk today is about the SKA, but also gonna talk to, I'm going to talk to you about how I got there and what my path has been to actually get to this project. Because SciFest is aimed at encouraging students to adopt maths and science, to get excited about it, and to explore careers in maths and science. So hopefully, we'll try and do that. Um, so who am I? Um, I graduated as a computer engineer at the University of Pretoria. Um, and the reason, well, I'll get into reasons why I studied engineering later, or if that's of any interest to anyone. Um, I had a bursary with ESCOM, so my first job was with them. Don't hate me. It was in good shape when I left it. So, um, but I learned a lot in every single job I've been in. And it was a very challenging environment, especially as a computer engineer, because um, I'm not sure if you know too much about computer engineering. I think engineering is, is a lot more popular if you're a civil, chemical, mechanical. But with, in a nutshell, computer engineering is probably the best of programming, but as well as a lot of hardware, as, as well as electronics. So in ESCOM, it's a little bit difficult to find a, a good fit there. But um, where I, when I left ESCOM, I left to join the CSIR. And I was working in electronic warfare. And I really, really found that I fit in there very well. And I really enjoyed it especially because I wasn't really, I felt that I wasn't really suited to a more corporate environment. And I felt that working in research in CSIR was really the start of, of finding where I should be. And um, eventually I landed up at the SKA, which I'm enjoying, and um, hopefully describe, uh, explain to you why I'm enjoying it so much. <laughs> okay, so just to give you a little bit more background as to what I did at the CSIR, um, like I said, I was working in electronic warfare, specifically in defense, peace, safety, and security. And yes, it is as cool as it sounds. Um, <laughs> so we were working on modeling and developing um, electronic warfare platforms and systems. So a lot of warfare these days is not really going to take place on the ground. It's going to be electronic-based. And at the CSIR, although I can't really go into too much detail as to exactly what I did there, it was all super safe and really nice and not, didn't hurt anyone at all. But it was really about developing a knowledge base and about finding out how we could um, develop radar and electronic warfare systems. So the SK South Africa, what we're trying to do essentially, is build the world's largest, most powerful radio telescope. And the idea is that it's going to be 50 times more sensitive and about 10,000 times faster than existing radio telescopes in the whole world. So just think about that. Little old South Africa is going to be building the most sophisticated radio telescope. We're going to be drawing scientists and engineers from all over the world. We're going to be using this, sorry, this facility to answer age-old questions about the universe. 
That is pretty cool. So a bit of background about radio astronomy. Um, astronomy falls into two school schools. There's optical astronomy and radio astronomy. And essentially, radio astronomy focuses on the detection of radio signals from space. And that's how we're able to produce images and um, answer all these questions that I'll get to later. So the main difference between optical and radio is that radio is unhampered by poor weather conditions, cloud cover. Um, optical telescopes are often affected by the weather conditions on Earth. Radio telescopes are also able to see things like invisible gas because it's not obviously detected by the optical telescope and it's not obscured by things like cosmic dust. But here's the rub. Because radio telescopes work with signals at longer wavelengths, they often have to be a lot larger than optical telescopes. So to get the same resolution that an optical telescope would, would, would provide, we need to literally build an antenna orders of magnitude to get that same resolution, but also to be able to see more. So how do we do this? Through science and engineering. So instead of building a, a single dish that will have to span kilometers, which is not possible right now, we build, we build an, an array of dishes. So it's little dishes arranged in a certain way to mimic a large dish. And in doing so, we're able to get an, a better resolution than an optical telescope will provide. Once the SKA is complete, it will provide um, a resolution better than even the Hubble telescope. So that's, that's quite outstanding. And the way in which it does that, as I said, is that it links an array of radio telescopes to create what we call an interferometer. Say that 10 times fast. No, it's OK. Don't. But yeah, so the idea is create an array of radio, radio telescopes that work together to mimic a single dish. And um, if you're interested, it works in the frequency range of between 50 megahertz and 20 gigahertz. So what do I do at the SKSA? So as I said, I'm a computer engineer, but I work in as a systems engineer. So this is a relatively, diff if, if you're thinking about exploring a career in engineering, you have the different disciplines, chemical, computer, electronic, um, and others. But as a system engineer, you're required to tie together um, all the disciplines to focus on the design of a complex system. So the SK is considered a complex system. And system engineers focus on the design and following the design process from start all the way up to actual construction. And the great thing about the SKA project is that it brings scientists and engineers together. We need the scientists to actually do the science and tell us whether what we're building is meaningful. And we need the engineers to actually build it. Um, why this is great is because typically scientists and engineers do not get along. Um, engineers are far more cooler and a lot more intelligent and scientists are just these crazy party. If it weren't for engineers, scientists would just be looking at the sky going, Wow, that's really shiny. So the great thing about the SK is that it's, it's all of us pulling together, not fighting, just finding a way to get along, but to build this one, this one huge facility that we can all use. So what do, we, what do we hope to do with the SK? So those questions that I was talking about, these are questions that haven't yet been answered. But the idea with building the SK is to provide a facility that we can, or well, the scientists can play around and answer these kinds of questions. So how are, how are stars and gal galaxies formed exactly? What is dark matter? How large is the universe? We don't know this yet. Does Einstein's theory of relativity hold up? And are we alone in the universe? Is there life out there? And with the SKA facility that is so highly sensitive and has, that's going to offer so much processing power, we'll actually be able to hopefully answer these questions. But wait, there's more. So apart from answering all those questions and gaining a deeper insight into our universe, and maybe even ourselves, we're actually going to build a world-class scientific research facility. 
that has actually already drawn scientists and engineers from all over the world. Right now in our offices, we have uh, astrophysicists currently working on the Meerkat, which is the precursor to the full SKA. And they're working on it and already drawing meaningful signs, meaningful results um, from the facility. And once the SK is fully developed and completely operational, it's just, it's going to be great. It's going to be just a great astrophysics party in the crew, but for science. Um, also, the, a project like the SKA does so much more than actually just build a facility. The aim is also to provide or to establish a radio astronomy facility or learning center in Africa. Yes, it will be based in South Africa, but currently it would be the largest, the largest astronomy field or space of, of expertise in Africa. And of course, it also creates a new job market. So when students are considering um, going into university, radio astronomy becomes an actual realistic choice of career because they'll know about the SK, they know that there are jobs available and they know that they have access to a radio astronomy knowledge base in their own country. So how does it work? So essentially, as I said, there'll be an array of radio telescopes all mimicking a single dish. So the data will come through and tons of data will come through from all these individual telescopes. Then it will go into what we call a correlator or beamformer. And the job of the correlator is to aggregate all these signals from the individual telescopes and make it appear as if it's coming from a single dish. So the challenge there is to maintain the data integrity, to make sure that nothing's lost from the individual telescopes, and to also ensure things like timing, RFI, which is uh, radio frequency interference are all removed from the data stream. Then it moves to a high performance cluster and where the data is then processed into actual useful information. So the data will come through and we'll be able to process it through high performance computing and then hopefully come up with something like an image or an image of the sky at a certain time or at a certain um, year. And that is actually the meaningful information that comes through. So in essence, this is, this is how it will work. So the phases of the project, we're currently busy with Meerkat. So Meerkat is the South African built precursor, and that consists of 64 dishes. And the idea behind Meerkat is that it serves, it serves as a test bed, but it's also going to eventually be incorporated into the full SKA, which is all 128 dishes, and that's, that phase is called SKA-1. But the idea behind Meerkat is to learn the lessons, to explore different types of technologies so that we can leverage what we learn from Meerkat into SKA-1. Okay, the challenges of this project are considerable. Um, because of the scale of the project, it makes it quite a challenging, uh, just not just from an engineering point of view, but from a logistical point of view as well. So the SK is an example of a big data project. The scale we're talking about is something like, because I was talking to young people, younger people today, I just put it in terms of iPods. We're talking about data of the order of 2 million 64 gig iPods a day coming through. So that's data coming through all the, tel all the individual telescopes that has to be processed and not just discarded, but also stored and archived. So in terms of the infrastructure involved, just the number of drives and disk storage and memory you would need to actually facilitate this amount of data coming through, it's mind-boggling. And nothing, there's no, no commercial system that's available currently that we can just buy and put in and say, well, that's going to be our memory store. Everything we do is new. Everything we do has to be designed. So. Every, every sort of system we design or subsystem of the SK is largely a creative process. It's thinking out of the box. It's looking, yes, it is looking at what's available commercially, but a lot of what we do, we have to build ourselves. So you'll see that last point there. I say that the SK and everybody working on it, we feel like we're pioneers. We're doing things and we're exploring technologies that have never been explored, have never been implemented before. The way we're cooling our electronics, for instance, is one of the ways in which it's, it's novel. 
So what we're currently doing is dunking all our electronics in oil. It's a specific type of oil, though. So it's a, a very novel cooling system because all our electronics will be situated in the crew, in the desert. And we found that we couldn't find a, an adequate cooling system. So we've had to experiment with different types and look at the way maybe other companies or other big data systems are using or doing their cooling. And we couldn't find something that was adequate. So we spent months just looking at what could we do. And someone had this radical idea of using a certain type of oil. It's totally safe. It's, we can fry things in it too, so it's, we can eat it. It's okay. But it's a very novel way and it's, it's working. But we are going to be the first people to actually implement that in a system like the SKA. And we've already written patents on it. So that's, that's the advantage. It's, it's a double-edged sword when you're working with a novel project like this. You don't really have anything to go on, but at the same time, when you actually develop a solution, it becomes new knowledge. It becomes something that other people can use, and you become the person who started it. So that's both a challenge, but also a really, a really good sense. You get a really good sense of accomplishment when it actually is solved, when you solve the challenge. Um, the other challenge that is um, also a, a good and a bad thing is working with engineers and scientists all over the world. So there are more than 100 countries involved in the SKA-1 phase. Meerkat is based in, well, we're hosting both Meerkat and SKA-1. And most of the engineers working on Meerkat are based in South Africa and are South Africans. But SKA-1 involves about 147 different countries. So on my team, for instance, we're working on the data processor part, which is the, you'll see, it's depicted here as high performance computer, but it's actually the data processor part. So once the information or the data comes through, um, my section of development is working on how we make that data into something meaningful, turn it in, into information. And on my team of about 10 people, I'm the only South African and everybody else is from Australia, the UK, Malta, um, Spain, Canada. So when we have a meeting, we don't have a meeting in a room. We are on Skype, or we, and and you lose a lot from not having that that face-to-face -face interaction, and from not being in the same office. So that is that is a challenge, and it has been a challenge for us to communicate, to make sure that we're all on the same page as to what we need to do and how we need to go about it. And yes, they, we've had to explore different ways of of doing that and circumventing that that challenge. Um, but it's possible, and we learn. Um, but that can also be a good thing. Because you're working with people, with scientists and engineers from different cultures, different countries, um, you're exposed to a lot more, and not just in terms of technology, but in terms of mindset, in terms of culture. Um, so yes, these are both challenges, but they're also really good areas for growth and learning. OK, so just to get a little bit personal, why do I work at the SK? Um, well, as I said, it, it's a challenging project. Uh, as an engineer, it's, it's the project. And working on something like this challenges you both as an engineer, but also just as a person. Um, I get to work with people who are way smarter than me, so, which is both a bad and a good thing, because you have to pretend to be smart, too. Um, <laughs> But no, but work surrounding yourself with people who are, who are very smart um, encourages you, kind of makes you feel bad, but mostly just encourages you. Um, also, the SKA, uh, what I like working, why I like working there is we're working in a collaborative environment. It's not just me sitting at my desk coding. I'm working with, with everyone, and we're all working together. So you'll, you'll see that best with the Meerkat project. So you have the engineers working on different areas or different sections of the design. You have the hardware guys doing the actual um, hardware and correlated development. You have the, the computer guys working on the processing. But everyone in that office, all of us, we're all working towards one goal. And in a company, that's not always the case. Um, at the CSIR, for instance, I was working, we were all working on different teams. And we all had our own deliverables, our own objectives. 
um, our own milestones, but at the SKA, we're all working for the same thing. We're all working to get 64 dishes up in the crew producing science. Um, well, because it's such a geographically dispersed project, we do get to travel quite a bit. Um, so we do have those face-to-faces, which are invaluable. There are just there are some things you can only do face-to-face -face that you just cannot do over Skype for work. So it gives you that opportunity to, to interact, to travel, to experience different cultures, different people. Um, but probably the thing I like best about working at the SKA is because I feel like I'm contributing in some way. You're contributing to a bigger picture. You're not just working to earn money, get a paycheck, and live your life. You're, you're actually part of something. And you're proud of, of what you're doing because of the impact that it has. So this, I think, is more aimed at schoolgoers. So if you're considering what to do next or what you would like to do after school, things to consider that I found useful that I didn't know when I left school or left varsity um, that I wish someone told me is to, to think about where you fit in. So what kind of environment would you be, would you feel most yourself at? Because that's where you will actually do your best, where you feel good. And this is not always something you would know now, but it's only something you would know once you're in ESCOM or once you're in the CSR. You would know whether you fit a corporate environment, whether you fit a more technical environment, whether you like working with people, or whether you like sitting behind your computer and just working alone and everybody just leaves you alone. So when you actually enter a job or consider changing career or going to a different career, just consider that. And then to also think about what is important to you. Uh, there's nothing wrong with just working to get a paycheck and if that's just your job and that's it, that's absolutely fine. But what is important to you? Is making a lot of money important? Because if it is, don't be an engineer. Um, uh, is make, being part of something big, something that will help your country, something that will help other people, or you know, going into defense research and finding new ways to blow people up. So it just these are the things that you need to consider, and not, not, no answer is wrong or right. It just depends on what resonates with you the most, because once you know that again, you'll be in the best position to actually achieve and do your best. And what do you want to achieve? And where do you see yourself? Interviewers ask this a lot. Where do you see yourself in five years? I usually reply with, not dead. So, because we don't always know, but it's something to think about, not just for interviews, but for yourself. Because when you're in a position or when you're in a different company, you want to think, or have that in mind, like, is this helping me get to where I want to get to eventually? Um, and as a closing note, I would just encourage you to be patient, to gain that experience, even if you are in ESCOM or any other company that you don't feel quite suited to, be patient. Um, look at what it has to teach you. And the way to do that is to be open and ask for help because it's, it's okay to ask questions that you think might be stupid questions. I still do that, and will continue to do that. Um, but ask for help and gain the support of the people around you, whether you're in university or in a job. Just be open and ask and learn. Okay, thank you. Um, before I take questions, I just wanted to show a, a video of Meerkat and what the site would look like.
Thank you. I have a question about, about data storage. Yes. It's a lot of data, as you said. So I imagine that if you put the data on two conventional hard drives, you're going to fill up a room this size within, what, a week or a month or something? Where is all of this data going to be stored? Where is that going to happen? And how long do you envisage you will actually be able to store data for before you run out of storage space? Okay, it's a really good question. Um, thanks. So, yeah, it is the data storage is a big challenge, and no one solution is going to be implemented. So we have we have a an array of storage which includes tape drives, which include to store raw data, and then um, cluster computing, and we also have support from the high performance computing center that's also going to be a site for some of our data storage. And then we also are developing something called a storage pod, which is going to be basically a collection of high performance um, platforms and separate t drives. Um, the other thing is that our data policy, we do archive a lot of the data, but we don't, we'll only store it up to a certain, up to a certain point. So all that raw data coming through, streaming through the processor won't really be stored, you know, ad infinitum. There'll be a, a time, a, a, a timeline for storing that amount of data. But there's no one solution. And also we've looked at uh, cloud-based storage. So a lot of enterprises like Amazon offer cloud-based stor cloud storage for big data projects. And we've had studies into those and we've also seen that what they're offering, what they're offering is not readily implementable. It will still require, so the answer is that there's no one solution and there's no one sort of device or technology. It's going to be a combination of a lot. Yeah. I understand the SKA project was awarded to Australia and us jointly. Are they building their own SKA array and are you pooling your data or are you operating uh, separately? Okay. That's a good question. So when the bid was announced, we had seven, it was a 70-30 split between SK, uh, uh, between South Africa and Australia. So they're two different facilities. So we call, the one that's going to be housed here is the larger of the two. And that's called SKA Mid. SKA Low will be in Australia and that is a, a much smaller facility and it's working on a different frequency range as compared to SKA Mid. So, well, we definitely have the lion's share in terms of, uh, in terms of the, uh, the budgeting and things, but also our facility is going to be much bigger. But, and currently, there's no connection between the two because the type of data they're collecting and the type of science they're producing, because they're working on a different side of the spectrum and different, in a different frequency range, it's, it won't be uh, the same facility. Um, thank you, Shagita. Um, yeah, one question that's been puzzling me, where is all the finance coming from this? Who's actually paying for all this? So the SKA head office is located in John Roll Bank in the UK. And it's, I'm not the best person to ask about this. There's definitely money coming in. And <laughs> but it's being funded by um, SKA International, so the head the UK-based headquarters and South Africa's part is just to to host to host it, and um, very the, all the countries that are involved have a certain amount of buy-in into it. But I'm not the best person to ask about about the money thing. But I could I could find out more if you want, and we can maybe chat after this, and I can put you in touch with the with people who would definitely give you a better answer. Thank you. My interest is 
after you have explained the functions of this, I just want to check, is there any relation when it comes to SKA with the problem that we are facing at the present moment, which can be helpful, the one of global warming? Um, global warming and the SKA, radio astronomy, um, I can't think of it, of uh, how they would correlate right now. Space and global warming. Um, I'll have to think about that, that one. Because the idea behind the SKA is to, to explore space and radio emissions from different sources and to trace back through history things like the origins of the universe. But how it would relate to global warming, I, don't, I can't see a direct, maybe if we find alternative life, we can go there. And <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, but no, they, I don't think I don't think that there's any direct correlation that I can think of. Sorry, global warming, more planet. Uh, I would like to ask the question, which was shown on how are stars and galaxies formed. I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We know that they, we can detect them, and we know, well, we kind of know, but we don't know for sure. And the idea is to, to look at how they're formed through time. So with the SK telescope, we're able to do that based on the radio waves and the, the detection of certain types of cosmic dust and also invisible gases. From, that wa from the basic sort of uh, composition of what we what we pick up, we're able to detect that, and we're able to to see how that actually happened, exactly how it happened. We have theories. Everyone has theories about those questions that I posed, but we don't really know for sure. Nothing is conclusive. But I'll let you know as soon as we find out. Another question. Sorry. Um, do you have a, a way of excluding? Extra uh, radio frequency emissions, say from satellites, other man-made uh, emissions and so on. That's a good question. That's actually, I forgot to mention, but exactly why the site is in the Karoo. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's completely far away from any other source of radio frequency. So when we, or when we go to site, for instance, we're not allowed to take cell phones. Or it's the idea is that it's a completely clean environment. But as far as interference in space, the thing about radio astronomy is that uh, that would affect things like optical astronomy. But radio astronomy is not affected by weather or what conditions they are on Earth. But what it is affected by is the area in which the data comes through. It needs to be in a clean environment, so there needs to be no other source of radio frequency, C cameras. Um, anything digital really emits radio frequency. So that's why it's in the crew. That's why we have RFI shielding. RFI is, is the devil in terms of the data coming through. But that's the only, um, the only thing that challenges the data integrity. Yes? Yeah. Not, not radio, not radio waves because it's a different, um, different frequency, frequency band. Um, the scientists that you have working on the data are mostly astrophysicists, are they? Mm -hmm. Or are there other scientists as well? That's the one part of the question. And then the other one is, um, are South African universities geared to teaching astrophysics and which ones? Okay. A good those are good questions. So yes, it's predominantly astrophysicists. Within the astrophysics um, field, there are different types. There are cosmologists, there are pulsar scientists. So there are all those microchasms of astrophysics, and we have them all working with the SK. Um, but we also have computer scientists, and they're mostly involved with the actual data processing. It's not the actual science, but to get the data in some kind of 
processable way where it can be run through um, physics software and yeah, processed by the actual scientists. So I say it's, mo it's astrophysicists and computer scientists. Uh, and the other question was the universities. Um, yeah, so we have a lot of students who are currently doing their uh, postgraduate studies, a lot of postdocs who are based at Rhodes, um, UCT, uh, UWC, as well as, um, what else is it, uh, WITS as well. Um, so they are definitely, there's, yeah, people are able to, to study radio, astro radio astronomy at, I think, most institutions in the country. And um, it's gaining traction in terms of the postdoctorate level studies um, happening in radio astronomy. Hi. Thank you very, very much, first of all, for this beautiful presentation. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful for me to, uh, to, to be here. Um, thank you. You know, at school level, we are asking the grade nines uh, during October month, around about there, to make a subject choice, which I think is highly unfair. I mean, when I was a matric, I didn't know what I wanted to be. Mm. Um, now, the parents obviously assist these guys. Who else? And then the teachers get a five minute chance in the front to talk to these people, take science, take biology, take history, do this, do that. You know, everybody wants to fill up their classes. Mm. How, do we, how do we tell the community out there, how do we tell parents and children out there in grade nine, what is awaiting out there for them? They don't have to leave South Africa. They can become engineers and they can come to fruition in their own uh, uh, milieu in this country. I mean, how long ago was SKA announced? Long, long ago. About how many people years. out there do actually know that there is a profession to be had? Mm. Uh, is there any way that we could sort of publicize this better in the future? Um, yeah, that's a very real challenge. I think having to make subject choice um, in grade nine is a lot of students are ill-equipped to, to make that decision. Um, but that's why things like SciFest and SKA itself is also running quite a few outreach programs and to, to get the word out there and to, to let people know that a project like this exists that is massive for this country. And yeah, we could definitely do better and do more, but I think, I think for me, what, uh, as we approach June and this deliverable, uh, where we have 16 antennas, and we're able to produce the first science, the first images. Um, we're already producing that, but not officially, and also we don't have all the antennas up. So we've got this major deliverable in June. And w as, we, as we're actually approaching that, we see it gain traction. It's, it's more exciting because we're actually gonna produce things. So I think as the project develops, it will be more visible to the public and we can definitely increase our outreach programs, but more needs to be done for sure. How would you suggest that going to schools individually or just simply making it visible via the media or mainstream media? Because we're doing both. We're trying to do both. We're trying to get to schools. We're trying to come to places like SciFest. Or, and we're also trying to put it out there in the general media. So my only hope is that as the project itself gains more traction and as we produce more um, viable results, science, and we draw the attention of the international community, that more people would see that and more, it would become a more, uh, it would be more commonplace for kids to know that radio astronomy is a viable career option. Not just astronomy, but engineering or science or computer science. Um, and I think a project like the SK is so great because it shows that we as a country have this enormous capability and that we can actually host a project of this magnitude. And I think that will only become evident with time. So you answered part of my question, which was when will you have the first results? Okay. Uh, but what is the timeline for completion of Meerkat okay. and phase one? And how do you see the rollout or distribution of the information that you produce? That's a good question. So, yeah, so the first real deliverable where we have 16 antennas up and we have um, 
uh, images being produced would be in June. And that's what everybody's wo everybody at the organization is working toward. And the idea for Meerkat being uh, final and uh, fully operational is 2017, the end of 2017. SKA phase one is 2021, where everything is up, it's in construction, and I mean, it's been constructed and everything. Um, that's the idea. But we're also thinking beyond SKA one. Um, because once it's built, or once it's been constructed and we start producing science, beyond SK1 is SK2. Who operates it? Who owns it? Um, what is South Africa's role in it now that it's built, now that we've hosted it? So we're thinking beyond that too. Um, and apart from the actual milestone delivery producing the science, it's also hopefully going to attract more, not just radio astronomy, but more projects of this nature. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm just wondering why South Africa specifically was chosen to host this project. Because we're the best country ever. <laughs> <laughs> because we put in the work. So I, someone mentioned, yes, it, the bid was announced a while ago. It's been ten year, over 10 years in the making. Um, so when proposals were, when the proposal was issued for, um, or when the call went out for proposals rather to host it, it was a quite a big effort. I wasn't at the SKA back then, but I'm told it was a very exciting time. They put in the work, they wrote the papers, they spoke to the people, they had the meetings. It was, it was a collaborative um, effort between um, astronomers, engineers, um, Department of Science and Technology. And it was, a, it was quite a lot of effort to actually to strengthen that proposal to get that bid. It wasn't just the case of, okay, where, where do we host it and let's let the headquarters decide. We actually had to propose it and jump through all the hoops and show that we were actually capable of doing it. So it wasn't just a water to us, we actually had to prove that we could actually do it, even if we weren't totally sure at the time. But yeah, it was a lot of work. So it didn't have much to do with geographical location? So yeah, well, that's part of the proposal, to prove that you can actually host it. It wasn't a case of, let's scour all the deserts and choose the crew. It was a case of, where could we host it? Currently, the world's largest radio telescope, which is a single dish, is in Puerto Rico, in a natural, um, yes, concave thing. So it's currently there. So it's not... It wasn't about where is the best location, let's decide on South Africa. South Africa said, we can do this, we have this location. Yeah. Yeah, for the, um, so it was, that's why it was between Australia and, so yeah, I guess that is about one of the constraints. Energy, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to make a really bad pun right now, so I'm going to say I'm in the dark about it. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure, but dark matter for sure. But dark energy, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, I can find out. That, that would be interesting to me, actually. Thank you.